on this episode of Still Loading. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of Still Loading. As usual, I'm your host, Josh Koval, and we are continuing with the summer of PS2 episodes. That is right. We are moving right along. This week's episode, we are going to jump into the game Devil May Cry, uh, which is fitting since the last episode was Okami, and it's another Hideki Kamiya game. But with me to talk Devil May Cry is a friend of mine, uh, Cody. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited. This is my uh, podcast debut. You're my first. Be gentle. <laughs> Just breaking that podcast cherry. Mm-hmm. So, as I've been talking with every guest on this for the summer of PS2, what is your earliest PlayStation 2 memory? Or do you remember when you got a PS2? Yeah, I definitely remember when I got it. Um, well, <clears throat> I remember the events of getting it. I don't know if I could give you the exact year. Nah, that's fine. I, definitely I, don't, I don't even remember a specific year I got my N64. Mm-hmm. I definitely didn't get it. At launch, I probably got it maybe in like 2002, 2003. Um, I remember going over to my friend's house. I was in 34th grade, and he had Dragon Ball Z Budokai. That's and a great game. That's was, going to be... Actually, I need to check my list. Is that before or after? That's actually uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> so, great game, and being a child in the golden days of Toonami, seeing that game was mind-blowing, and I thought, I have to own this. And I remember I had, you know, leftover birthday money, Christmas money or whatever. And I was dead set on buying a PS2. And I got it probably a few weeks after going to my friend's house. And I just remember there being a huge blizzard. So maybe somebody can go back and look into a huge blizzard in 2002, 2003. I was going to say the blizzard in 96, when, but that wasn't no, when it came out. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Definitely not that. Because I remember being snowed in all weekend and playing that game. And I remember even... um the Frieza boss fight my mom helped me beat, which is really? hilarious. That's kind of awesome. Because she doesn't play video games ever. So I think that's maybe the one time I she ever played a game. I tried to get my mom to play video games, and uh, I had her try Donkey Kong 64, and she could not understand the controls. Mm-hmm. And at, you know, as video games went along, it was harder and harder for her to really understand. And I mean, she didn't really play games growing up either. But I just find it funny, like to hear, like, "Oh, my parents helped me beat that." I'm like, my dad played Medal of Honor, and that was about it. <laughs> that that was the only he liked World War II games specifically, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, it, it's even weirder for me to think about because I kid you not, that is the one and only time my mom has ever played a video game around. Really? Me. I don't know if maybe she just thought. You know, at the time, maybe she was kind of just blown away by how it looked. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was getting a kick out of how excited I was. But I remember I kept trying to beat Frieza, and Frieza's an asshole. He is. And so then I I don't remember if she offered or if I asked her, but she beat it. And that's definitely my earliest PS2 memory, because that was really the first weekend I had it, and I just binged that game. I was because, like I said, it's going to be an upcoming episode for the summer of PS2, Mm -hmm. but I actually was replaying a little bit of Budokai and it still looks good. Yeah, you can definitely see the datedness of some of the graphics because of the PS2, but it doesn't look aesthetically bad. It just it looks it holds up surprisingly well. I think anime games that tend to be the case because as long as you get it to look somewhat like the anime, same thing it with tends like to hold up better. Even with games like Sly Cooper, mm-hmm. Sly Cooper yeah, has maybe like even the, just that the, the cell shaded cartoon yeah, graphics. Yeah. But so we're talking Devil May Cry. Yeah, back to that. Um, so back Devil May Cry, here. yeah, right. Devil May Cry came out on August twenty third, two thousand and one, in Japan, and October sixteenth, two thousand one, in North America. It was developed by Capcom, and the director, like we mentioned before, is Hideki Kamiya. Mm-hmm. So this game was super interesting. It was super groundbreaking at the time it came out because it had there hadn't been a 3D game like this at all, to, at least to my knowledge. Uh, at least, Definitely not one as big. At least with this, uh, at least with this aesthetic and this style. Mm-hmm. 
it was originally going to be a Resident Evil game, and then when they added all these different mechanics in, the the I forget, Shinji Mikami, I think, is the Resident Evil guy. He did not like the direction it was going. He didn't feel it was Resident Evil ish. So they just switched focus, and it turned into Devil May Cry. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much how the game was born. Uh, it was the name. The main character's name is Dante, ba- named after you know the author of the Divine Comedy, mm-hmm. Dante. And the game is loosely based, very, very loosely mm-hmm. based mm-hmm. around that. Is Mundus a character in the Divine Comedy? That's no, the villain of the is, game. He is Satan. And um, fun fact that when I you know I did some research too, I didn't want to come in here just without looking into a little bit of the backstory, but. Beatrice Trish blew my mind. Never thought about that. Is that her full name, Beatrix? No, Beatrice is who Dante Alighieri is looking for in the, in Dante's the, in the Inferno. Inferno. Oh shit! Yeah, and Trish is them being clever, and then you know there's the more obvious one, Virgil, named after Virgil. But yeah, the Trish one blew my See, mind. See, I don't know anything about the Dante Inferno epic poem. See, so, oh, back when that game Dante's Inferno came out. Being somebody who grew up level, loving Devil May Cry, I was very excited for it, and I went and bought the Divine Comedy and read it all, probably like three or four times because it's a dense read because it's mostly speaking in um, phrases and idioms and like you know you kind of have to decipher it, but it's yeah, yeah. really really expertly written. That's really interesting. I didn't know that you actually read that. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so who is Virgil in the Divine Comedy then, the book, the poem? Virgil is, um, he was a Roman politician, I think. He he helps Dante get through hell. Okay. Like, he, he help, he's kind of like a guiding light for his path to finding Beatrice. Which kind of makes sense. And I guess for everyone's benefit, spoilers to fucking back, because we're going to be talking about the game story in mm-hmm. depth here. It's it's 19 years old. If if you care about spoilers, that's your fault. Well, everything PS2 is at least 10. Well, any game for PS2. Oh, no. The latest PS2 game, the last one came out in like 2012 or 2013. So the last PS2 game isn't even 10 years old yet, which is wild to think about. This console had a lifespan and mm-hmm. a half. That... It lasted right up until I think either just before or just after the PS4 and Xbox One launched. So it spanned almost two full generations, which is just crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Hideki Kamiya, this is pretty much his what became his signature style of game. Uh, the this, the gameplay in this is very based off of combo is is based off of a lot on combos and how style quote unquote stylish you can be, mm-hmm. and he tried to make Dante as stylish uh, once again quote unquote as possible. And Dante, admittedly, hey, he looks pretty cool. Hey hey, knock off that quote unquote because Dante is a cool guy. <laughs> he Look, is right here at my notes. Biggest thing written <laughs> Dante at very is bottom. A, I see it. There's a big ass asterisk. Two that, of them. That's factual. Dante that's is cool, <laughs> listeners. Um, he so is stylish. So let's dive into this story here. So the main character, it's about a guy named Dante who you find out is a half demon or is he whole demon? He's half demon. He's half demon. His mother is human. His mm-hmm. father is demon. His father's mm-hmm. name is Sparta? Yep, with a D. Sparta. D. Not yep. Sparta. Sparta. Mm-hmm. Um, and the game begins with a cutscene of... This woman named Trish breaking into it almost is like a detective agency. Yeah, yeah. So Doesn't she like drive her motorcycle the, through the window? This is as soon as I started playing, I wrote this down like in a frantic fury because I need to talk about the opening of this game. Go for it. Di- Replaying it, go. it, you know, I played this game probably back. I came to it a bit later. Um, should I get into that first? Before? By all means, whatever. Yeah. So my introduction to the series was actually, ironically enough, Devil May Cry 2. Um, same friend that I saw playing Budokai, I came over his house and saw him playing Devil May Cry 2, and it blew my mind. And, you know, this was probably... Devil May Cry 2 came out in, what, 2003? It's a good question. I don't, I don't know if it was. I think keep, it was, like, keep, roughly... Keep going. I'll yeah, look it up. I think it was, like, roughly two years later. And so it was probably in the summertime I remember going to this house, seeing Devil May Cry 2, just like Budokai going, I need to have this. And my birthday is in the summer, so I got Devil May Cry 1 for my birthday. And so I definitely don't remember the opening of this game 
But replaying Good call. it. January 25th, 2003 there was its go. initial release date. I'm sure that's the Japanese release date. I don't know the... I'd have to look closely yeah, for the American out, one. I think 1, 2, 3 all came out two years apart. January 25th, 2003 is the North American release date. January 30th, 03 is the Japanese. So, so it actually came out in the U.S. beforehand. I got it exactly six months after it came out because um, of my birthday. But yeah, so the opening of the game, you know, you get this very very 2000s feeling title scroll talking about like two millennia ago oh my god you're right that is that is every single 2000s fantasy movie that that exact clip if you told me that it was from the spawn movie i wouldn't i I would believe you without thinking i'd go (laughs) yeah that's spawn and so you know you get that little opening a little scroll explaining sparta and then it cuts over to i guess the city you know, maybe like wherever New York he's or at, something. they don't really tell you. I feel you. like Dante is like a New Yorker. He seems like it. He's got the spunk. And, he's got uh, the spunk. And yeah, so, you know, you see a neon sign, place called Devil May Cry. Badass name. It is a good name. I'm and, not going to lie. Yeah, you know, he's answering the phone, Devil May Cry, this and that. And yeah, you know, he's running a demon hunting business, which I'll, I'll get back to you. It's almost you, you Hakusho ish. You know what? No, I'll ask it now. What do you think Dante's rates are? Because His I'm rates. dying to know. Oh, uh, for demon removal. Yeah, like I mean, he's, how do you stay in business? He's definitely in competition with the Catholic Church. Yeah, with all their uh, exorcisms. So it's got to be a competitive pricing. So it can't be anything outlandish. He's not. He doesn't have a monopoly here. I don't know though, but I could also see him being that type of like, you know, I can get rid of, of your demon maybe without he the ends religion. Up not you know, if, if low income people get demonized too. So you think he's going to go and? And just take all their money and no, like, no, I'm not saying he demon. would. That's what I'm saying. It's a competitive pricing. Yeah. He's not going to market himself uh, based off because you know if you have a monopoly, you can just ri- raise mm-hmm. your price up, price up to an unrealistic proportions because you you're the only one in town. Does he, does he pay by the hour? Does he pay by the demon type? Definitely by. I bet you the hourly rate is based off the demon type. Maybe that's Maybe. what I'm guessing. I'm gonna guess. Basic demons like those stupid uh, like puppet demons that you saw the mm-hmm. the, the string the, it almost looks like they're it literally they're just looks like puppets. actually called mannequins mannequin demons. maybe that might be wrong the, I would say those are thirty bucks an hour okay and that's I, pretty that that's pretty good I mean especially because they always come you know they they come in a pack you're right I mean oh then we'll go thirty dollars per okay well be it'll be per demon thirty dollars per mannequin uh maybe like. 50 per those weird uh what is it those uh i'm just blanking on it now the 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 ghost ladies with the scissors yes because that's the second demon type you fight in the game i will throw as much money as he wants to get those things away those things are awful um so yeah uh so she yeah sorry i no, i I went off rails um you're good so he you know he's answering the phone taking business call and then she just comes crashing through his door on a motorcycle pops a sweet wheelie and you know dante being the cool guy that he is is like all right i'm gonna immediately put the moves on this chick and then you know starts talking about the fact that he's a demon hunter and shows her his giant sword <laughs> and <Out of> context <laughs> and then she <laughs> grabs it and i guess more or less reveals that she's a demon because she electro- electrocutes him with the sword then beats the crap out of him kicks him to the wall throws that sword at him and then picks up her motorcycle and tries to throw that at him but dante being a cool guy pulls out his two guns <laughs> Ebony and Ivory, which... Is that is that his gun's name? Yes, and they're black and white, and they're named Ebony and Ivory. I did not know that. And he shoots the motorcycle back at her. <laughs> and just, bam, end of podcast, great game. <laughs> the, like, you, you, can't, you can't beat that. That is an I, opening. That, this game is so amazingly anime in the worst and yet awesome way. Anime is good sometimes. that's a that's a sentence yeah um no it's there's so many as you guys probably heard in the little clip at the the beginning of this episode it's got some interesting voice acting it's got some interesting moments there's so many we'll we'll get to that moment (laughs) there's so many moments in this game that make no sense 
It's very, it's so anime it hurts. And if you like anime, you can appreciate how bad that is. But in, like, you legitimately appreciate, it. like, you're enjoying how bad it is. It's almost, it's almost an ironic liking, but at the same time, y- you secretly love it. I don't know. It hurts so good. Yeah, that's a good way to describe yeah, it. Yeah, guilty pleasure. But then you know, I guess Trish basically explains that the Demon King Mundus is going, is coming back, and she wants to hire him. And then, I don't know if you picked up on it, because it doesn't really explain it till later, but when Dante sees her face without her sunglasses on, he it kind of flashes to, like, a picture he has at his desk. They don't make it clear then, but the reason why is because she looks like his mom. They, they, they make it clear at the end of the yeah. game, yeah. So then, you know, she takes you to Mallet Island, and... Mallet Island. It's a good name. That's... It's cool. And it's basically just a medieval castle, but an island. And that's really where I guess you know I that's guess it where the, that's where the gameplay picks yeah. up. The first thing I notice when the gameplay when they actually let you take control of Dante is the there's two things. One, the cinematic camera angles they chose. They were very cool camera angles that made it feel the game. It made the game feel a lot more epic. And the other thing I noticed is that they all suck. They look visually cool, but for gameplay purposes, it is not fun to play through the game with those fixed camera angles. God of War gets it right in the sense where they don't move the camera angles all that much. This, the camera jumps continuously depending on where you are in the room. Yeah, it kind of clashes with the style of the game because your biggest enemy at times can be the camera, which is really a lot of PS2 games, but definitely. And I'm willing to forgive the bad camera because it's such an old PS2 game. It's mm-hmm. 2001. Yeah. It's one of the, it's practically a long, I, actually, it's it is a launch first year, game. right? It's within the first year. It's within the launch window, but it does make specific moments that we'll get to as we go through the story and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Very difficult, specifically when you fight the bird on the pirate ship. Yeah. That was, that is, it's very disorienting in there. That's, that's, yeah, the entire any sequence related to water is probably the worst part of this game. Uh I would say so. Now, admittedly, a lot of my opinion on this is going to be colored by the fact that I suck at this game. It is a very difficult game. And that was very intentional. Uh Kamiya really wanted to make it a very difficult game. I forget. I actually wrote a quote down for him. I guess I don't have it on there. But um he intentionally wanted to make it difficult because he thought everything at the time was being too nice to players. Mm-hmm. And I don't have an issue with that. I would say my biggest, but I'm going to get my biggest gripe with the combat out right now so I can just say it and we can move on. And I won't, I won't harp on it. I th- think the difficulty is more artificial than not. Uh, a, a, good, a lot of people compare this difficulty in this game to more modern contacts with like Dark Souls and with Bloodborne. And I'm bad at those games as well. Those games, the difficulty comes from you memorizing patterns. If you're not good, if you're not noted, or not even patterns, but it's from noticing all the enemies' tells, and you, it's a very trial and error type of game. I don't like those kinds of games. I don't like. I don't enjoy bashing my head a wall in a wall the on a wall multiple times just to get two inches further within a game. This game is similar to that, but where the difficulty is in uh, Bloodborne and Dark Souls. It feels more fair. This one, it feels padded because the enemies take so many hits. They're just damage sponges. And I don't have an issue with that if the enemies didn't take out a third of your health with every hit. Just about. As the game goes on, you start killing the weak enemies within one hit, Mm -hmm. which makes sense. That's how you want to feel powerful. So once again, good game design. But my biggest overall gripe is just that, especially early in the game, it just doesn't. It the difficulty is not fair. Not in, and not because it is difficult, but because it's just the enemies have an unnecessary amount of hit points. If they would have made it so they still hit you hard, but you instead of killing them in eight slashes, it took like five. I think each. I know that's such such a specific thing. I think that would have been a lot more fair because then two hits wouldn't have screwed me over for the rest of the mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It- you know, talking to you, gearing up for the episode, it was interesting to me that you had so much trouble with it. Because Devil May Cry is definitely a series that's known for difficulty. And maybe it's just because I'm a bit more familiar with the genre. It's 
you know, it's probably you also one of my just might be genres. better at those types yeah. of games. I I really didn't have that much difficulty at all with it. I I beat the game pretty quick. I only died, I think, like seven or eight times, and so I've been thinking about it, and I think I found the solution as to why you were having trouble with it. Okay. The game is rated M, which means it's not for babies. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> so, no, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe I'm just a bit more familiar with it. No, I'm, maybe I, I, like, I have more experience. So, like, I, I'm probably better at it just because I've been playing these games since I bought Devil May Cry 1. I will I will say, so, the like I said, my only real gripe with it is just the fact that the they're all damage sponges. And mm-hmm. that's not fun for me necessarily mm-hmm. I understand. bloodborne enemies at least from when i played bloodborne and i don't i don't like bloodborne not because the game itself is mm-hmm. bad but because i'm bad at it Those, yeah. they don't feel like damage sponges mm-hmm. that you take them out in one or two hits mm-hmm. but the difficulty comes from all of your swings in that game have so much weight yeah. that you have to really time your attacks and time your dodges and it's the same for this it, there's a little less weight to your attacks and devil may cry but you still have to time your attacks and time your dodges mm-hmm. and I found it easier just to mash the like shooting pistols at enemies than I did anything else. And that's so like the whole purpose of the pistol is not to necessarily do damage. It's to keep your combo going and the combos give you better ratings. Mm-hmm. And then the ratings give you the ratings are arbitrary. I don't think it affects the ending. Does it? It doesn't affect the ending. It, it's basically, you know, actually it's bragging rights. It's bragging rights. I think it was part of the thing too, like the in, the entire combo system and and um, difficulty. I think it was partially also just to give the game more legs because it's a pretty short game. It is a short. The the long play I saw it was only three and a half hours. Yeah, and the guy died one or two times and also mm-hmm. got lost a handful of times. Yeah, I mean, I I beat it in a little over five hours. First time playing the game. In probably like 15 years if i were to go and replay it i could definitely beat it in under three um the combos i know in later games like when as your combo goes up your damage goes up so okay you know, if you're hitting an s combo you're you're doing more damage per hit okay. but i don't think that's a thing in the original game okay i mean if it is i it's not indicated during the game now we were talking about this before uh because the first boss you get to so i guess we'll let's talk about the gameplay up until the first boss okay. so a lot of the game is broke. Well, not a lot. The entire game is broken up into different missions. You have twenty three total missions, mm-hmm. right? Yep, twenty three. They grade each of your combat things by, and they tell you right in the top right. I'll say dull, cool, awesome. I, I don't know if there's anything else above awesome. I yeah, think there's S, like one S. stylish, stylish. That's it. Mm-hmm. So in each of your combat situations, you'll see a word in the top right corner. And it'll tell you if it's dull, cool, awesome, or stylish. And At bo- the end and of bold. each B. and bold, yeah, D C. B A S. Uh, okay, so it has each of the letters. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and then when you beat the mission, it gives you a ranking as well mm-hmm. of your your yep. overall ranking throughout and then the mission. It gives you a total at the end when you beat the game. It gives you your ranking for that playthrough. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I believe the first boss occurs at in the middle of the third mission. Either at the, no, maybe the it, the yeah. middle the fourth. The, no, no, it's basically the third mission. Um, usually a boss mission is like a little bit beforehand, essentially just getting to the boss, and then the mission itself is the boss. So it's, yeah. the th- it's mission three. Before we go into that, I, I want to talk about another moment. In mission two, you know, after you go to the Mallet Island, you get into the castle, you start investigating, spooky stuff's happening, there's weird mannequins and creepy ladies with scissors. Um, you see a sword in a statue. Oh yeah, this scene. And this is one of the top moments in this game. I think you know, as a, when I was young, this oh, is this one of those would... things that just blew my mind. Oh yeah, every you... any kid like especially like the, the age you were at when this game came out mm-hmm. cuz you would have like been 10 like 10 or 11. Yeah. It... This would have been the coolest fucking thing in the world to them. It's still kind of it. Dante is still one of the coolest dudes in the world. Um I I I'll tell you why I think he's a little less cool later on. It's not I don't think it's his fault. I think it's the way they chose to tell the story's fault. I'll go. Yeah, I'll, we'll, I'll go into. We'll get it. into it because you know there, there's. He has his moments where he's not cool, but look, everybody slips. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll get into that. Um, but so you see this giant sword in the statue, and Di- Dante probably thinks, well, it's a giant sword, so it's right up my alley, and then it starts like emitting lightning mm-hmm. and shoots out and stabs him, like through his chest, pins pins him him to to the the ground, ground. Yeah, dead. Dante's dead. Except Dante, cool guy. Not dead. Climbs up the sword, 
climbs through it, which would make the without hole in him his hands, bigger. Without yeah. using his he hands, just he basically just basically like Undertaker rises. Yeah, and again, like the hilt would make the hole bigger. So not really practical, but you got to commit to the bit. And then picks up the sword and just starts swinging it around and being a badass. And then that's just like that sword's just his now. It's called Alistair. I think. Yep. Alistair. Alistair. Uh, yeah. Alistair. And it's got like a cool, like the, the hilt is like a dragon mouth. I found that to be, and so, I mean, it's the only weapon I got in the game because like I said, I was bad at this game. I got to the first boss and rage quit. I didn't even say rage quit. I got to the first boss, tried it once, couldn't figure it out. I was like, I'll get back to it. I'm like, I don't have time because I got to prep for these other summer of PS2 episodes. So I watched mm-hmm. a long play, but, uh, it's the guy who was playing the long play. It seemed like that was the most useful weapon. I mean, yeah, would you yeah, agree? Definitely. Um, you get another sword later on. That's good. But the thing with Alistair is that it gives you devil trigger, which I talked to you about this. One of the major things in the game, probably one of the biggest issues is the tutorializing. It doesn't tell well, you anything. I, I don't have an issue with that either. Only for the fact being is that it's a 2001 PS2. game, Yeah. And at that time, not a lot of games were giving you all the giving you giving you the tutorial through gameplay. It was a lot of it was you had to read the manual. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, don't get me wrong. There are exceptions. Uh, Mario sixty four, banjo, the banjo kazooie games. Mm-hmm. They teach you all your abilities as you go along. Almost, a little, it's a little bit obnoxious because they overdo it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it, as long as I think we said it, as long as it's in the manual, I'm cool with it. Actually. I have the game manual right here. I'm going to go look at, to see if it is. You keep on talking. I'm going to mm-hmm. see if it's in the manual. Just make sure I'm not bullshitting here. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, and you're right. It's in the manual, but I remember talking to you about it. Um, you had a little trouble with the first boss that we're going to get to in a sec, and it's because the key to beating him is using Devil Trigger, which is pressing L1, and da- Dante kind of goes like half demon form and looks really cool. And. He has a couple different yeah yeah he gets like a full devil trigger at the end of the game and then he gets even more devil trigger fuller in other games in the series but yeah so i mean alistair devil trigger is such an important thing it makes you faster it makes you stronger you heal while you're in it um it's pretty it's pretty crucial to playing that game and also just alistair is just a good weapon it's good for crowd control the other weapons have their moments but that is definitely the one i stuck to throughout it I'm trying to see here. So they have, they tell you how to roll, somersault, rolling dodge, somersault, jump, check items, gun attack, lock on, uh, high time, which is hold down R1 and move the left analog stick away from Dante, away from the direction Dante is facing and press the circle button. Continue holding, yeah, hit the circle button. Continue holding the button to jump. Finally, when jumping press the circle button again to slash and bash enemies in the air okay uh yeah so it does tell you devil trigger right in here yep. you can use devil trigger by equipping either the thunder sword or the flame gauntlets and i think it's weird they didn't give them their the yeah i forgot game names. that they um uh, that the gauntlets have devil trigger as well when not the i other when either item is equipped or three or more dt and three or more DT gauges or devil trigger gauges are charged. Press the L1 button to perform devil trigger and use the devil power while it lasts. And then it does Alistair Thunder, Alistair Thunder Devil and Ifrit Fire Devil. Uh, while using devil trigger, Dante's attacks become more powerful and his vitality recovers a little. You can extend devil trigger by using purple orb or cancel the devil, tri- devil trigger by pressing L1 again. So you can conserve some of that devilish energy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's in the manual and it's that's a very old school style of game design where you had to read the manual in order to know how to play yeah. the game. Now, admittedly, even on this early PS2 era, that was for the most part phased out. There was it or it was at the latter half of it being completely phased out cuz even if you look at early PS2 stuff like um like Jack and Daxter had all the tutorials for how you Mm -hmm. do everything right then and there. They had that full tutorial Island in the original Jack and Daxter. Um, And it's the same thing with Ratchet and Clank. It's the same with a bunch of these early PS2 games. And like I even mentioned a bunch of N64 games, they teach you everything as you go along. So I'm not surprised that it, they had it in this, but at the same time, I'm a little disappointed that it was like that because there was precedent at that time to have fixed that. Yeah, I mean, and I would, you know, I'd actually argue that that goes along with your artificial difficulty. You know, 
they could have a tiny menu pop up to tell you that, and they don't. So that that's certainly something that lines up. I can confirm that two and three have proper like, hey, this is how you attack. Would you say two and three is easier than one? No. No, really. No. What about four? I've heard um, four is like a little bit more fair. So I was actually going to mention this at some point. I would say if you're looking to get into the series, like maybe give it another shot, I would say five is your best bet. Um, five the newest came out one that last just came, year. The, the, that just most recently came out at the time of this yeah, recording. Five is smart enough to realize that you should make the game playable even if you're not good at it, but then also have that added layer of trying to be stylish when you are good at it. Um, the Ninja Theory one is probably the most casual. That's but just DMC, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a different game, um, which real quick, I mean... You and me were talking about earlier, like what type of genre is this game? And it, it's a tricky genre. We were talking off mic multiple. about it. Yeah, yeah. we were talking yeah. off mic about it's a it's considered a character action yeah. game. Yep. But what is the definition of a yeah, character action game? That's the hard thing we've been we've been trying to pinpoint that. It's a little mm-hmm. harder to find. Yeah, and I actually um I went and tried looking around because I've seen other terms for this game too. I also refer to it as a character action game. Apparently a pretty common consensus is to split it into a, a subgenre of stylish hack and slash and casual hack and slash. The, the Capcom Devil May Cries would be stylish because it's much more about Well they literally have a being gauge more precise, gauging your style. Yeah, and like being just I guess better at the game. Games like God of War and Ninja Theory DMC, they're more casual. Okay. But yeah, definitely I have Ninja not Theory's DMC, so I might try that. People hate on that game. It's a great game. I need to try that then. Because um, I will admit, the, the difficulty I do think is, I think ob- I'm trying to be objective with it too. I think objectively the difficulty is unnecessarily padded. But I will say a lot of my frustration with it isn't the difficulty's fault. It's my inability to master that difficulty. Mm-hmm. So I will I will readily admit that is a that is a problem on with me. Yeah. Um, what I did think was weird about because we're we're getting up to the that first boss. Mm-hmm. We're pretty much there. Yeah, Phantom. I, the, that's the, the name of the scorpion looking thing. He's like a lava spider with the scorpion tail. Okay. Um. I do think it's weird how this game is designed in terms of its quote unquote puzzles. It's pretty much some you find some arbitrary item, you remember some other location earlier in the in the castle that you explored that had the same shape as that arbitrary mm-hmm. item. You go back to it, you use that item as a key, whether and then you move on to the next segment. And yep. that's for the most part, that's how the game progresses you in between bosses and mm-hmm. in between story elements. Yeah. There's not a lot of intense story, like moment to moment story details as you play through the game. It's not like Bloodborne where it tells a lot of the story through its environment. Mm-hmm. Do you know, do any of those items, because they, they're very specific names. Each of the items have mm-hmm. a very specific, specific name. In fact, at the end of the game, you get a Philosopher's Stone yep. to mm-hmm. unlock the last area. And I thought that was odd because it doesn't seem like it has any bearing on the story. Do you know if it does, um, or is it just uh, does, is it I, items that kind of fit in with the the concept of the divine comedy? I think it does actually tie to it. Um, you know, there's there's appendixes in the game, and I know for a fact that with bosses and enemies and villains, they do give you backstory if you go and look at them. And as you fight them more and more, you unlock more. Um, I guess like dialogue for that character or villain i don't remember if there is specifically stuff for the items i would think that there is because yeah like you said like the philosophers philosophers then that's the uh, key to the underworld and yeah kind of a weird thing to just to have as talk a, about that but then there's like the lion's mane and mm-hmm. stuff like, it's not the main but you get what i'm saying there's yeah. like something lion related yeah but it was bizarrely specific name like they could have just done generic keys but they mm. didn't they had very specific items and i don't know if it was definitely intentional clearly but i don't know what their intention was that's why i thought I, it was so strange i do think that is something where the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, this was originally a Resident Evil game really shows its roots because that mm-hmm. is very Resident Evil. I've never played those games, believe it or not. I have the first Resident they Evil. They are all about... And I have the fourth one. Yeah. I hated the controls for the fourth one. They are all about find this item and use it at a spot you used to be at. That is a huge thing for those first like two or three It's games. very Metroidvania-ish mm-hmm. of yeah. backtracking through, uh, especially this one because it's a castle that you're exploring. It feels very much... Like, I still haven't even played Symphony of the Night. That's, like, one of my gaming 
everyone has what I call like a gaming sin, like a game you've never played and you know you should. That's one of mine. I know I need Same to play. Here. I need to play Symphony of the Night. So you go to fight. What's the spider? Phantom. Lava Phantom. Phantom. I thought its voice was kind of weird, yeah. but it, it was just I wasn't expecting it to actually speak because it doesn't look like it should, but it, it did. Yeah. So. <laughs> curious question the voice acting did it seem low volume during things like like when phantom and dante talk it was really like maybe maybe it was just my game's audio but it was kind of hard to hear them like i had subtitles on luckily dante no phantom yes okay. phantom was a little hard to hear dante in general i thought it sounded fine mm-hmm. there was a couple moments but for the most part i didn't have any audio issues okay yeah and then you fight phantom and you know, I, I think this kind of goes back to the game not teaching you because the only way you can hurt him is in Devil Trigger and the game doesn't tell you how they activate Devil Trigger. And you know, it doesn't tell you that certain enemies can only be hurt by Devil mm-hmm. Trigger. Uh, but at the same time, that I, that's not the game's fault. I think it should that's that onus should be on the player because when you're fighting a boss and you're struggling, you need to use everything at your... Yeah, press L1. <laughs> yeah, like try all the buttons, like try all your different abilities. So that... I don't have any. I do agree that they should have said something, mm-hmm. but it wasn't. It was in the manual. So if you read the manual and you saw that you have that ability, you should have known. I you should have known that you could have done it, but it 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 is frustrating because that, that you told me that I just haven't had a chance to go back to try to beat mm-hmm. that boss with it because the mechanics of the boss aren't that hard to figure out. It has a couple like lava pools that shoots up mm-hmm. out of the ground that you have to just run around and dodge. Um, just dodging it itself is not difficult. Yeah. It's damaging it is really difficult. Yeah. Like, I remember you told me that you had gotten stuck on him. So when I played it, I activated Devil Trigger, ran up, hit him in the face, and killed him in maybe two minutes. So, but I understand you didn't know they used Devil Trigger because it didn't, it didn't tell I didn't you. even know it existed. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So after you defeat Phantom... Uh, it took me a second. I had to remember what his name was. I did. I I did actually like the the little section leading up to him. How you walked across a bridge. The bridge got gets destroyed, mm-hmm. and then you have to hop back across it. Yeah, which I think is kind of cool. Missed every time. Did you? Is yeah, it- I'm. I'm Plat- not really good at platformers. I mean, I love platformers. I love Mario games, but I just. I always miss. Luckily, you just go to the bottom of the water and you walk fight a over. couple more skulls yeah. and you go back yep. up top. I will see. That's where my specialty is. I'm not good at character like stylish action platformers. I'm not good at Bloodborne. I'm not good at Dark Souls. I am good at platformers, both 3D and I'm getting better at 2D. Like platform precision platformers. I wouldn't say I'm like a good Mega Man player by any stretch. Mega Man's really difficult, but mm-hmm. Mario games I'm pretty good at. Like. I beat Mario 3, and that's a tough game. Yeah. But anyway, so after you beat Phantom, you pretty much just keep... Because the game doesn't give you any direction as to why you need to go as to in a certain direction. You're just yep. going into the next open door that just mm-hmm. opened from you defeating him. And it, is there... Up until the next boss, which I know you, want, you probably have a lot to say about that next oh, yeah. boss, is there any memorable moments prior to the introduction of that boss that you can think of? Because um, otherwise, we'd just be like talking about... You fight some new enemies, and that's about it? Um, There's not, you know, so without getting into the next part, I guess for me the most memorable thing was just replaying this game, seeing how Resident Evil it really is. You know, it's very, it it's finding those little puzzle pieces and opening doors, being in a fixed location, you know, Spencer Mansion in Resident Evil 1, Mallet Island Castle, um, even the camera angles they're a very resident evil thing that sense of loneliness because even though trish goes with you to the island she ditches you first chance she gets literally the first minute she just in. hops up and is like all right peace good luck go beat yeah. the demon king i can see what you're saying it's it, 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 it's it very, isolates yeah. you and it and it's not a horror game but there's definitely horror elements there's only that. one enemy in the entire game where i thought was legitimately horrific and it's pretty far into the game it's actually near the end, I'm pretty sure. There's like this weird homunculus looking thing that puts a mask on its face and then like it transforms into a larger version of itself. And it just, oh, fucking. Those guys are assholes to fight too. They those, are, they are I, not fun. Literally, when I was watching the long play of it, I was getting, I was creeped out the whole time. Mm-hmm. I just had a frown on my face. Not because I thought it was bad. I was just like, huh, no, thank you. See, that's, that's just, and the screeches it would yeah. make. Oh, it's just nasty. That's me with the um. I can't believe I can't remember the name, but the you know the the wraiths with the scissors. I don't know what it is, but those giant crooked scissors—they're just 
they're freaky. Um, you know, I wasn't scared, but it, it's a really cool. It's a really cool enemy design. That's something else about this game. Like enemy design is great. They're it's called me. sin scissors. <laughs> I knew that too. Uh, or sin scythes. Now sin divine comedy. You're right. And then, um, yeah. Yeah, so Phantom is that is the is the big uh, boss that we're talking mm-hmm. about. Uh, you also end up fighting shadows, which are those cat monsters. Yeah. Those, oh, you know those what? Are that, annoying. that happens shortly after Phantom and before and the it's, next boss. It's, a, it's kind of a mini boss. It, it's, yeah, it, he's tough. The game does a good job of gauging your skill mm-hmm. f- continuously, so that way you can never get to a spot in the game where you're in over your head. Yeah. You have and, to earn your way through it. Boss fights are definitely skill checks. And they're, they're very different. I mean, and that's what they're supposed to be. Like I said, I really didn't enjoy this game because of how bad I was at it. But watching the person play it, it was a very fun game to watch. Surprisingly. Yeah, because if you're good at these games, you know, the whole thing is about style. If you're good at these games, they're a blast, um, especially the later ones, because they double down on that. And actually, one of the ways to keep the because ch- the whole thing based on style is based off your combos and to chain combos together. One of the major gameplay elements of chaining combos together was based off of Omni Musha uh, Warlords, believe it or not. Uh, during a testing play, a test play, Kamiya discovered a bug where you can indefinitely keep enemies in the air by slashing them, and it inspired the juggling mechanic where you could hit an enemy up, okay. you know, shoot him with, uh, shoot him a whole bunch of times to keep your combo going, and then keep slashing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they had that was very that was baked into the game, even though the inspiration came from a bug from a different game. Hmm. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I looked that up. <laughs> so, the next thing is the next big thing after you fight yeah. the after you fight the the uh, shadow cat thing. Probably my favorite moment in the game is the introduction of ne- Nilo Angelo, which what a like stupid and yet amazingly dumb. Like it's it, an amazingly good yet dumb name. It fits that that divine comedy like Renaissance Gothic horror thing that the whole game is. It that, also that's the aesthetic f- of the entire game. It also feels like. A bad '80s sci-fi mm-hmm. name, you know, Nilo Angelo just sounds like that would be something in a Dolph Lundgren fantasy movie. It sounds like the, like uh, Masters of the Universe original or name for for the uh, Neo from the Matrix. Yes, <laughs> well, that, that's yes. his cousin. You know, Neo's cousin Nilo. Nilo Angelo. Um, so you know, you're one of the rooms you go into is the bedroom, and you see this sinister-looking mirror, as Dante says to himself, and then. You it goes to cutscene. Dante turns around, not facing the mirror, but spooky. The His mirror reflection faces keeps back looking at him. at him. The reflection faces back at him. Yeah, and then you know Dante realizes that, and then the reflection of himself walks through the mirror and turns into Nilo Angelo, who's this very again you know that like Gothic Renaissance look. He has this this cool knight. helmet on of like yeah. these big horns, mm-hmm. and it kind of looks like. Almost like it would be like a four, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. I could totally see very, it as in like some cool other look. game. And then, you know, that's just a cool introduction is he, he is originally Dante's reflection, which when you it think is, about it, is foreshadowing. It definitely. is heavy foreshadowing because spoiler alert, you find out later Nilo Angelo, and it's not even explicitly said, which I give credit to the. It actually is in the uh, the codex thing I mentioned. Oh, really? If you read Nilo Angelo's codex, yeah. After it, you yes. figure out the events. Oh, oh actually, the cutscenes, they talk about it too, where, yeah, he is Dante's brother Virgil. Yep. And, well, I maybe I just missed it in the long play. I thought I saw it, but I thought I didn't see anything in the long play of them explicitly saying he oh, was yeah, his they, brother. They, they definitely it, do. it is very clear because what happens at the end of it, after you defeat. So you fight a lot of these bosses numerous times. Mm-hmm. You fight Shadow, the 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 fire scorpion spider Phantom. thing. Phantom, sorry, Phantom, the fire scorpion spider thing. Numerous times mm-hmm. you fight Nilo Angelo. Numerous times yep. some of the other bosses that you see later on, you fight numerous Gri- times. Griffin and Nightmare are the other uh, two. Okay, mm-hmm. so you fight them at least twice each, and. After you finally defeat Nilo Angelo, I think on like the second or I think on the third. Third, yeah. It's towards the, the end of the game. On the third time, you see him drop a pendant that's exactly the same as Dante's. And mm-hmm. that's a big plot point because uh, we'll get to it when we get to that port portion of it. But it kind of tells you right there it makes sense. And also, after you fight him in this first time, yeah, the first time. he has a chance to kill you, but he sees the pendant on Dante mm-hmm. and stops, yeah, like throws him against the wall and runs, runs away. away. Yeah, and um, actually, now that I think about it, they do explicitly say that he is Virgil, but they don't explicitly say that Virgil is Dante's brother. 
That makes yes, you're right. Yeah, they because do say it's it, even if if you go into your inventory and look at the pendant, it says because it, it's it's your mother's pendant. It says that you know something about like with all my love, Dante and Virgil. So that's the game telling you that they're brothers, but they do not out loud say, "Hey, Dante is Virgil." But I I actually am a fan of that because, and this is something I'm actually bad at in games, and this is I, so this is. I know it sounds it sounds so egotistical to say it's big coming from me, but like I normally don't like games that don't spell it out for you. I like exposition. I like not thinking. I just want it to happen. But I like the fact that they don't spell that out for you. That you have to pay attention to the game to kind of read through the lines. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you, if I had not known Virgil was Dante's brother going into this, I probably wouldn't have picked up on it. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's cool that that it's there for people who are observant enough Mm -hmm. to do it because it doesn't take anything away from the story to have him not be his brother but it just makes it 10 times cooler to know that virgil is his brother but you don't do do you know do they ever explain why virgil turns evil or why virgil was evil in the in the first uh devil may cry so maybe in the third one because that's a devil may cry 3 is a prequel so virgil was always evil um it's you know their their character types are pretty cliche they're both half demon dante is the good guy. He uses his powers for good. Virgil's the one who thinks that he's better than humanity. And so he's always not a good person. And then Dante kills him and he becomes a servant of Mundus, who again is Satan. And, and so you, you kill him in the third game. I'm spoiler yes. alert yeah, for the third the end game of that I've never played. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, at the time too, like, Virgil is such a big part of that series. He's been in numerous games. And it makes me wonder, like, did Kamiya always plan to do a prequel? Did he plan to do more with Virgil? Because it, it's a it's a character that's important to the larger lore that in Devil May Cry alone doesn't really do much. It's kind, it's kind of funny because I was thinking, um, uh, what is it? I was thinking about this. Do you think this, like Devil May Cry, is Capcom's Metal Gear Solid? The reason I'm asking that, hold on, I I need to look up the release dates for Metal Gear Solid 3 specifically. So Metal Gear Solid 3, right, came out in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Devil May Cry 3. 2005. 2005? Yeah. Okay, that's kind of funny because they follow a similar story path. You have Metal Gear Solid 1. Metal Gear Solid 2 is a direct sequel to 1, much maligned as well, comparably. I know a lot of people have grown to love Metal Gear Solid 2, but uh, it's much maligned. Mm-hmm. And then Metal Gear Solid 3 is a prequel yeah, you're to right. 1. That- Devil May Cry, first one's a classic. Second one is a little bit more maligned. Third one is considered a classic, and it's a prequel to the first one. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one yeah. is the fourth one bloated. It has does it have a lot of cutscenes. You have a two hour long cutscene in the th- fourth Devil May Cry. <laughs> I wish. Um, no, I mean you're definitely right. Those first three games follow a similar path. I would say that with Devil May Cry, they probably made more of it up as they went along. Whereas I believe Kojima probably had more of a plan, at least somewhat. I could picture that too. But yeah. Um, also, for the record, Devil May Cry Two is trash. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not. It's a bad game. I haven't played Metal it. Gear Solid Two. Is a great game. Devil May Cry Two is. Well, bad. I just remember Metal Gear Solid Two when it came out. It subverted everyone's expectations because yeah, you don't play a snake I, for so long. I've been which, replaying. Actually, that with I haven't even recorded it yet. But I guess at the time that this episode's released, the Metal Gear Solid Two episode would have already been released. Yeah. So yeah, it was a big subversion at the time, and it mm-hmm. caused a lot of chaos uh, within Metal Gear Solid fans. Yeah, I remember. Um, there was a show X Play on G Four. I never watched G Four. So I know what it, I know. It was, I know what the channel is, but I never watched G Four. They had a top five most disappointing sequels of all time, and both Devil May Cry Two and Metal Gear Solid Two were on that list. So it's funny that you would bring that up. But yeah, they're similar. I do. I do think though that the in general people look back on Metal Gear Solid Two a lot more favorably Definitely. that than a like, lot of people consider it one of if not the best game now. Whereas Devil May Cry Two has just gotten has and always down. will be the worst game in the series. That's crazy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, after you fight Nilo Angelo, you don't know he's your brother yet. Mm-hmm. You, you fight him. It's a pretty tough fight from what I saw too. It seemed at least he he's one of those types of bosses where he's similar to you. 
you know, his attacks are very he's similar. He's the shadow link of the game. Yeah, I mean, and again, you know, he he's your reflection. He's your, your brother. brother. So, yeah, they're very similar. Um, the key to beating him that I found pretty much any time I had trouble with the game is just be aggressive. If you don't let him attack, he can't hurt you. It makes so, sense. Yeah. I saw the guy doing it. He kept doing the, the forward slash like, mm-hmm. stab move. Yep, the stinger. And then that just stops him in his tracks yep, so yeah, often. Yeah, it's easy to break his animation because he always like does kind of like a long winding slash. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, you just kind of got to beat him to it. Uh, but then after that, he runs away and after he almost killed you. And then you progress on. Now, this is where my memories of the long play get a little foggy. I actually mm-hmm. paid a lot of attention right up until this point, and then it's kind of boring for me to watch mm-hmm. the rest of the way through. What are some moments? Because I'm assuming, I believe the next boss is then the bird, which, I, what was the name of the bird? Griffin. The Griffin, or just Griffin. Yeah. Um, I believe that's the next major boss, right? Um, or do so, you fight Nilo Angelo again? I think you fight him again, you, you, and, then the, do, and then Griffin. You do. Um so, yeah, I mean, the middle of the game is probably the weakest part, and it's only because there's less moments, I guess. There's just no story in the middle yeah, of the game. It's I all mean, arbitrary it's very, exploration. Yeah, it's very bookended. And, yeah, it's that um, one thing that definitely comes to mind is, and it's a cool thing about these reoccurring bosses, is there will be sequences where you go down a hallway and Phantom just starts chasing you and spitting fireballs at you, and you have to dodge him. And if you just, But if you just walk in the door and walk back out, he's gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, game design and it but that also makes it satisfying because when you later on kill phantom it's like you fucker i finally got you i do like the fact that they kind of make it so the bosses haunt you you have to keep and and actually defeating defeating phantom is a really cool moment that because they they drop a giant column on top of it and impales him yep and then mundus kills him no no actually no so you're confusing him with griffin Um, i am confusing you fight phantom on the ceiling and then after you beat him and kill him he falls through and gets impaled by i guess like that's what it was just a, a gate or some type of sharp thing he falls through it very awesome moment very cool death um and then it also cuts to trish who you know i guess has just been Watching, watching the whole you. time. And she says something like, oh, he, he's really powerful, which, yeah, I mean, he shot a motorcycle at you with his guns <laughs> after you stabbed him. But also, when Phantom's dying, he looks up at Dante and goes like, oh, can it be Sparta? And it kind of flashes. And it's supposed to show, like, you know, Dante is as powerful, if not more powerful, as Sparta, his dad. And I like the... is This jumps ahead a lot, but I like how at the end of the game, they really emphasize the importance of being human mm-hmm. it's you know because they what is it trish cries that he's like oh trish only, demons can't cry so that means these tears you're part human yeah. let's be human together or something like that. it was a really yeah. fucking All dumb right. line dante is a cool guy i will continue to emphasize that <laughs> i like that that's the but, same we've had we've had conversations yeah. off mic about as your go-to description for any character you adore all right look hear me out early 2000s Dante, Spawn, Blade, Wolverine. They're all going to the bar together. Wolverine. They're, Wolverine's like the president of the cool guy club. <laughs> and they're just all hanging out because they're all cool dudes. And Dante is a cool dude. But, you know, I guess he's got some weird Oedipus complex mommy issues because when he's talking to Trish is, is really when weird. he's not cool, saying things like devils never cry. This is the gift of a human. <laughs> Dante, you're better than that. <laughs> I'm glad you remember the dialogue that specifically because I saw it. I was like, uh huh. And I just moved along. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, and then they, they even, we'll, we'll get back on track. But at the end of the game, they renamed Devil May Cry to Devil Never Cry, which that's a dumb fucking it's name. It's a bad, it doesn't flow. And it's just, no. it just reminds me of that lame moment. And Dante Devil should, he's, once again, Dante is better than that. You're um, right. But yeah, so uh, after you kill Phantom, there's not really that much memorable stuff. You do some underwater levels, which are the worst Awful. part of that game. Luckily, they're about a minute long, but you literally go underwater. It's first person and becomes kind of a, a light gun game. Yeah. And the camera is 
so loose that every single time I moved, I had to stop and And readjust. this is actually leading up to the boss fight that I was talking about before yeah, with, with the shitty camera angles. Yeah. Because you fight Griffin once before. Yeah. I believe you before fight, that. No, you, the first time you fight him is on the uh, pirate ship, is but it? I think you see him before. That's what it is. No, he fought him once before, before the pirate ship. I remember on the... No, you I, you only fight him twice. You fight really? him pirate ship and oh, Coliseum. In any, play, in any case, uh, they... You get onto the pirate ship, and you have to go through those underwater levels to get on the pirate ship, mm-hmm. and then you somehow magically unsink the pirate ship, and it sails off. Demon power, baby. Demon power, I guess. And then you fight, and you you fight a bunch of enemies, and then the, the swords that are blocking from the captain's cabin open up, and then right at the next minute, you see Griffin fly over, and they close up again, and he has to go fight him, and this fight watching this guy fight i was getting so mad for him him or her because there's like three different levels that you can see there's because you you can climb up the 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 mast the main mast Mm -hmm. on the boat or on the ship and you can either fight griffin all the way up at the top of that main mast or all the way down the bottom and going up the main mast the camera changes twice it changes once in the middle and changes a second time up at the top. So there's three different camera angles this is choosing from, not counting all the multiple ones you'll get when you're on the on the floor of the ship. So if you go climb up to the top, magically get up to the top without getting hit, and you fight and you fall the way off, now all of a sudden you're completely disoriented because you don't know where you're at anymore because mm-hmm. the camera angle consistently changes. You, this you, was the one time where I was... I, uh, I thought that's not... I don't care that it's a 2001 game, excuse me, still learning camera angles. That's bad. That is not a good moment. You know what makes a game fun? Putting a giant mast and flags in front of your your view while you're fighting a boss in the air. The Griffin fights are definitely the worst boss fights. Because you can't. Both times. And it's it's not fun. It's so hard to hit them, too, because. Just shoot them. That's the only thing you can do. Yeah. You just shoot him. Eventually, he'll get low and then smack him around. And, and then that, he flies that kind off of again and you trick. have to keep yeah. shooting. It, it's, once again, unnecessarily difficult because yeah. that fight feels more out of your control than the others do. Mm-hmm. Like, even the enemies I was complaining about before, like the, the stupid marionettes that I think take way too long to kill, that still feels like it's in my control. I just think it's unnecessary how long it takes to kill them, yeah. which is the padded difficulty. This is like legitimately like it feels completely out of your control. Mm -hmm. That whole ship ship thing is just weird too. like it kind of just happened. I guess for aesthetic, maybe change up the environment. It is weird, though, because you're on an island. So is there like a maybe there's like a cave in the island, but it makes it. But he sails through uh, like past a dock on the edge of it. So it makes it seem like there's a canal going straight through the center of the island demon power <laughs> i don't know i don't know man it's, i yeah it's, it was weird it's weird um yeah and then so the ship happens and then i think around then is when you fight nilo angelo a second time there's really kind of nothing new with that fight he doesn't really change much at all no and throughout then, any of them there's no more but there's even like you know at least that first fight you got the introduction and the third and final fight you get the reveal that he's virgil but the second fight just kind of comes and goes uh, then you do end up fighting and killing after you kill or no, after you fight Nilo Angelo a second time. Do you fight Griffin the second time and that's when you beat him? I believe so. And that's in the Coliseum. Um, that fight, once again, not that fun because that one, it's not even that the mast is in the way. It's that he flies up pretty high. And it's so hard to And hit. it can just kind of be hard the same, same thing to shoot him and when he gets on the ground get in his face there's a couple moments i don't know if it was before or after that i think it's definitely before the third boss which is what's the third boss the the, the slime the nightmare yeah. yeah it wasn't insanely difficult platform but there's some bullshit moments at the same time where there's these like it's you're in a circular hallway and the floor starts moving and the spikes are coming up mm-hmm. and you have to keep yeah. running forward. Yeah, you do things like that twice. I thought that was actually kind of cool. Mm-hmm. My only beef with it is that you have to fight the scissors, like the sin scissors mm-hmm. enemies. And while you're trying to dodge spikes on a moving floor so you can't stop moving to hit them, that part I thought was complete bullshit because they give you such a small space to attack and you... It's so easy for you to get hit. It is so, so easy yeah. for you to get hit there. I thought that was super unfair. The guy died like, the guy who hadn't died at all died like three or four times on the long play. Mm-hmm. 
I actually didn't die during that part. Um, really? Yeah. The thing is with those rooms, there's usually a little side room, and you just got to kind of lead the sin scissors into that room and then they you know especially as you get through the game they die after like three hits it's just you have to actually manage to hit them they can be tricky they block a lot but yeah you know i mean that part it's kind of just you gotta time everything right which definitely i can understand why somebody else had difficulty i guess i just got well, I mean, lucky you, or yeah so you then you then fight the nightmare right? well well real quick um you had mentioned earlier but griffin's death scene you it is pretty cool. You know, you fight him in a Coliseum and then you drive that like pillar through his chest and then you get another flash of Dante looking like Sparta. And this one is to signify like, no, he is stronger than Sparta. And Griffin tries boasting and being like, I'm a call on Mundus and he's going to give me the power to kill you. And it's a very um kind of if you remember in, in Dragon Ball Z when. Napa gets beat up by Goku and, and, Ve- and asks just- for Vegeta's hand and Vegeta throws him up and blows him up. Yeah. Mundus literally does the same thing. He's like, nah, Griffin, you suck. Zap. You know you you know the price of failure. Yeah. Whatever and his voice Very is. cool moment. And I think Trish might pop up then too, but uh they don't do the full reveal with her yet. You mm-hmm. um after that, yeah, you then go to the nightmare. Oh yeah, you do find out that Trish is actually betrays you. Well, I already said spoilers. It's fucking. Funny. I more just mean that. Uh, you know, who would have thought the mysterious woman who broke into your business and, and threw, threw a, a motorcycle sword and you. a motorcycle at you, and then led you to this random island and ditched you? Who would have thought she'd be evil? And then you fall in love with her at the very end. Well, which is, well, it's we'll ridiculous. The, the guy has mommy issues. All right, he does have mommy issues. But um. So then you fight the nightmare. And I remember actually when I was younger, when I first played it, I don't know what happened, but I just remember being stuck on the nightmare for like a month and not even the fight. Literally, I would walk into that room where his puddle was and I didn't realize I had to to observe the puddle. I remember my friend who I saw play the game came over and walked up to the puddle and pressed square and I felt like an idiot. I don't know what it was, but that part's really cool too. It's very creepy. Um right before the nightmare, there are like the shadows turn start turning into Dante. They're like shadows of Dante. Oh, okay. But they're really weak and you fight a bunch of them. It's the weird it's very, like rainbow colored shadows. Yeah. Is that what I'm thinking of? And he, you shoot it's easier to shoot yeah. them cuz if they attack you, then it's a lot then they chain pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And um that is probably one of the closest moments that game feels to a horror game. Cause it's just like, it, it's, you know, the nightmare. So it, it tend, I guess it's trying to be a little creepier and yeah, then the nightmare reveal happens and it's basically just this uh, giant. Are you sludge. talking about if you get absorbed by the nightmare? No, or? no, no, no. It's right before you, you fight him. But when you get absorbed by him, he brings you into that. Like you go into like a, a, a core, another dimension maybe. And you fight previous skulls. bosses. And yeah, skulls. And, yeah. 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 I thought that you was fight, cool. You fight, um, phantom again, your buddy. I do like that to fight Nightmare, you have to run around and find the seals, and mm-hmm. you have to attack yep. the seals till all the the the, the symbols light up. Yep. And once you do all of its slime or whatever it is, dissipates and it reveals its 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 body. Yeah, the like, and even, cylinder. And even that, it's not weak. It you have to wait till it opens up like its back. Pretty mm-hmm. much, you have this big blowing, blowing, glowing blue. Yeah ball um yeah. you have to attack Night- nightmare design wise um like his character design is probably the laziest one but boss design wise he's maybe the most the battle creative. mechanics are super yeah. fun and because all the others it specifically like we mentioned griffin is an awful boss fight nilo angelo really feels like you have to master your sword mm-hmm. to you have to you have to have full mastery of your sword to do that and then i guess like you're saying since it is skill checks uh is it Phantom is the Phantom, thing? I, I'm the so bad with the names. Yeah. He is definitely like, can you use Devil Trigger? Can yeah. you use it? You can use it. Come on. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, definitely what it feels like. Yeah. And um, and, and Nightmare, you end up fighting three times, and it makes sense because, you know, like we had just said, you refight old bosses. They're weaker forms, but, like, first time you fight Na- Nightmare, you also fight Phantom. Second time, you also fight Griffin. Third time, you also fight Nilo Angelo. But um, in between the first and second time you fight him, you fight Nilo Angelo for the third and final time. That's where he shows up. And I think he just shows up with his helmet off. And he's got white hair, yeah. glowing red eyes. Looks like Dante. 
And um, he's a lot more aggressive that time. There's a lot he more. Is. That boss fight was kind of fun fight. to watch. It yeah. was a lot of there's a lot of projectiles. That's probably he at you. that's probably my favorite fight in that game. And but same thing as before, just be aggressive. And then once you once you defeat him, he drops the other amulet, and then you combine the two halves of the amulet together to form like the ultimate amulet. And that's when um. Your one sword, the sword that Dante brought, not Alistair, turns into Sparta, um, mm-hmm. which is like, I guess, his dad's sword. And it kind of looks like Soul Edge. From that scene Soul was Caliber. super cool because yeah. a, that sword could turn into numerous things. Mm-hmm. It turned into yep. a long ass scythe that was way disproportionate. Yeah. It was like Dante 20 being feet a cool long. guy. Just, you know, I just love that when he gets a new weapon, his instinct is just to swing it around like the Star Wars. Let kid. me impale myself with this first. Let's test yeah. this out. Let's see how sharp it is. <laughs> All right. Um, and then also during that cutscene, you know, you get the amulet, you get Sparta. Then it cuts over to Trish, who is talking to Mundus. And like we just talked about, Trish is evil. Yeah. Oh, who would have thought? And that's when they start talking about Virgil, too. And again, I, I guess they never say Virgil is Dante's brother. But if you've read any of the codexes or, or anything like that, like, or even just can piece together, like, this dude looks a lot like Dante. Yeah. That's, you know, that's when you get the reveal, though, about both Virgil and... Trish, and interesting thing, so Devil May Cry 5, I won't get into it, but there's an important thing in one that when you fight and beat Nilo Angelo for the third and final time, Mundus specifically says Virgil has been defeated. He has not been killed. He does not say that second part, but he does not use the word killed which is important for later in the series. Makes sense. Which yeah. I guess is a spoiler for... I mean, he comes back, but fair enough. Yeah. Um, um, but then after that is when you start going to the Underworld. And the Underworld is a pretty cool aesthetic. It's like very fleshy, very gross. Um, that's And, you know, you do things like collect the Philosopher's Stone to get mm-hmm. to the Underworld. You also fight Nightmare again. The Nightmare fights don't really change. Other than well, the Nightmare fight, the third and or the, the last Nightmare fight is where you find out that Trish betrays you. Yeah, that's, yeah. During the third fight, when you get him maybe down to like a third health left, Trish starts attacking you. Yeah. And that, I, I beat that part my first try. But I could see somebody having difficulty with that because while you're fighting Nightmare, Trish is shooting at you. The way they had it in the long play I was watching, she had got one shot off, shot off on the guy and then didn't interfere with him at all the rest of the long oh, play. She was, she was shooting at me the whole time, but I kind of just was like, all right, I got to kill Nightmare quick. So I just got right up on him. But she was like throwing her lightning. Maybe I just didn't see it. But Maybe, after yeah. you defeat Nightmare again, same same mechanic as you defeated him the other mm-hmm. times. But you kill him that time. You kill Third him that time. Third and final time, he's gone. And then you push Trish out of the way. Then Trish is about to die because a big pillar is about to fall on her. Mm-hmm. You push it out of the way. And she's like, Dante, why did you save me? Mm-hmm. And he's like, you love my mother. I don't know why yeah, I'm doing that yeah. voice. No, That's I not mean, how Dante sounds at all. He, he kind of does. It's not far off. Yeah, he, he saves her and he goes, you look like my mother. It's and very Cartman esque. <laughs> you look like my mother. You look like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh then uh y- yeah, I guess I guess she starts swooning at the moment that he saves her. So much swoon. And tries to be like, wait, Dante, let's talk. And he's like, get the hell away from me. You like, just try to kill like, me. I, I, you're a demon as far like, you know, he doesn't say this, but I guess his logic is like, we're even. Like, I just tried to save you, leave me alone. And then after that is when you go and do the Mundus fight, which is and an, a is, really good sequence. This is where I was going to bring back where Dante impaling himself and pulling himself out of that was made like I thought was kind of dumb. Mm-hmm. Uh, good I, dumb. Good dumb. But then it became dumb dumb right here because Mundus shoots these like red bolts at him and impales him. And all of a sudden, shit like that starts hurting, even though he got impaled with a lightning sword, and he was fine. Maybe like demon... I I know, I keep going to this, but demon magic. I guess. Because it's coming from Mundus. We did... I can't remember. There's something in between him leaving Trish and confronting Mundus. That might be... There's something in between there, because he has Trish, like, like, basically crucified. No, uh, so right after Dante leaves, you see, like, you don't see Mundus, but you hear him, like, you have failed me, Trish. You yeah, know, what, uh, you know the like consequences or something like that. Yeah. And then that's the last you see of her until she is, uh, like, taken prisoner by Mundus. Very cool thing, too. So you're still in the underworld because, you know, 
Very, mm-hmm. very Dante's Inferno esque. You're you're traveling through the underworld to fight Satan. Um, when you go and to confront, yeah. When you go to confront uh, Mundus, you open up and go into the room he's in, and it's like a cathedral. It's white, very bright. It's very it, it it's really striking because when you think of Satan's throne room, it's kind of the exact opposite of what comes to mind. Yeah, it's almost more you know more like if you were going to fight God which I guess is probably on purpose, especially if, you know, the Mundus is a giant statue that kind of looks like, you know, like how somebody would depict God, which if he's Lucifer, you know, that makes sense. That, it's I, a cool I, mean, I disagree with that, but I understand what you're the point you're trying to make. Yeah, it's very theological. Like I, I, could, I could see that, but I almost more or less... I, I don't consider... I, it's definitely theological because he's clearly the devil, mm-hmm. but I don't consider necessarily Dante trying to kill God. There's plenty of well, ja- I, I, Japanese I don't games mean that, that... I don't mean that Dante's trying to kill God. I more just mean that the um, the designs they went with for Mundus oh, yeah. are... Very, lot very more, religious. More, yeah, feeling. a lot more bright and... I mean, there and there are plenty it's not of how games I that do that. I just didn't think this king. one was. Yeah. yeah, no. I I actually thought the reveal of when you fight Mundus was really cool because his 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 statue starts shredding like mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, all the like all fleshy. the pieces break off. And but what's cool is underneath it, you don't see anything. It's just light. Mm-hmm. It's this it's this bright yellow light. And then all of a sudden, the whole cathedral breaks off around you, and you're in space. Yeah. And then I thought this was kind of weird because it turned him into it's, a shmup. It's almost. weird. Um, real quick, uh, important story things right before that. Um, Mundus does kill Trish, and but Trish dies saving Dante. Yeah, but not not our line yet. Well, the line's coming up. It's after the fight. It's after we'll, the fight. We'll, yeah. we'll save it. But so Trish dies, and I guess Dante's anger causes him to awaken his full devil trigger. Mm-hmm. And so he's basically now he's like he's more what I would picture Moonness to look like where he's like a full demon and then he has wings and then that's where yeah it pulls to it pulls out to what you are talking about where it's in space and it's kind of like a rail shooter and mm-hmm. uh yeah it was a little odd I it, I was really weird. worried that was going to be the final boss and I mean he is the final boss but I th- I was really worried that was going to be the final fight mm-hmm. and watching it is like that's how you're going to end it with a shooter and thank yeah. God, I mean, I didn't like what I saw for the second half of that fight, but I was very thankful that they did. Did I? I was much more satisfied with the way they did the final boss, the final fight. And the the reason I was saying I wasn't satisfied or I didn't like the final fight, like the second phase of mm-hmm. of Mundus, is it just looked bullshit. It just looked like just watching it. So much of it seemed unfair. There's not a really. There's no way really to to get to Mundus to hit him with your sword or anything like that. It feels all random because he creates these random mm-hmm. basically it's a big circular thing. It's a big circular rock formation. It's hollow in the center and there's lava all underneath it. And and think of it just like a like a you know like a like a like an O. And at random por- points the rock breaks so that way even though you're on the outer edge you still have to jump over these gaps and a lot of times you get stuck in the lava mm-hmm. anyway thankfully it doesn't do a whole lot of damage to mm-hmm. you but it still is there yeah and then he will mundus will randomly create other smaller circles within the center of the the outer one that you're standing on and they're taller so that way you can raise up and run over to him to attack while dodging his stuff that's all fine but 9 times out of 10 he doesn't create a stone formation that's close enough to him for you to actually attack him with your sword. So it feels like you have to keep, you have to attack the random objects that he throws out into the level to not only give yourself health, but to also give yourself devil trigger switch over to the fire gauntlets and then use the devil trigger. So that way you can hit him at a range to do a significant amount of damage. Mm-hmm. That's unnecessarily difficult like it's not i shouldn't even say difficult that's unnecessary like that's so arbitrary to how to come it doesn't feel like you're using as much skill as you did with the nilo angelo fight or hell even just the um the uh the, the fight the last fight with nightmare mm-hmm. so i swear i'm not making this up uh you i sent you a picture i beat the game recently i beat it the other day i beat moonness first try um when you do the rail fight I kind of oh, just spammed his well, yeah yeah I, I spammed his uh, devil trigger attack which he throws a dragon at him he like launches a dragon 
cool guy. <laughs> like <laughs> cool guy club, he, part he, of the cool guy club. He literally throws a dragon at Satan, and then so spam that move, beat him. Got to the lava sequence, and I guess I just got lucky then. Whereas the the video you watched didn't, because every time he spawned those platforms, they were right at his chest, which is where you hit him. And I would just activate Devil Trigger, mess him up. Hop off, shoot him until he spawned it again. I'll show you the video I, I yeah. watched because maybe the guy was just really bad. That could have been it. Maybe, maybe he was just maybe really I'm bad. Just an above average Devil May Cry. <laughs> maybe. I, I mean, don't know. He beat it, it faster was, than you, though. He did it in three and a half hours. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, he was pretty easy. Honestly, the times I died in the game, that it, I only died to one boss and it was Griffin in the Coliseum, but like I didn't have trouble with the bosses. It was like the, the times I had the most trouble are when I was in a tight corridor with a lot of enemies. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause it, especially cause the camera angles aren't very forgiving to help you with that. Mm. So then, uh, then you beat Mundus maybe. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you that, find out that you, he has one third and final phase, which yeah. is a little bit of an easy phase, but we'll get to that important thing i've learned in games especially basically any game that comes out of japan it's never the last boss fight <laughs> you Dude, always fight bosses two to the three times we, so you recently this is a bit off topic but it's dealing with boss fights that don't feel like feel like they never end you recently played through all the kingdom hearts games so the majority of them mm-hmm. you had, first, this the, was a low blow the first kingdom oh, that's not a low blow don't be you're i don't know why you're so embarrassed by liking kingdom hearts i like I'm, kingdom hearts i'm embarrassed because i kind of <sighs> well you trashed it for a while i i i spent so many years making fun of that series and then I was like, you know, I like anime. I probably would love it. And then I played it, and I love them, and I hate myself. Oh, uh, you're fine. But no, the final boss of the first Kingdom Hearts game, I think I counted has like yeah. seven or eight phases. Yeah. It is so unnecessary. You want to talk about diff- unnecessary difficulty? Mm-hmm. The Kingdom Hearts be thy name. Yeah. The final boss has so many forms. It's Stupid. I think I talked about it in my Kingdom Hearts episode years ago, but there was just so many forms to that boss. Yeah, I would actually argue that the first Kingdom Hearts is harder than the first Devil May Cry, only because of the uh, bullshit. <laughs> I was a lot better at Kingdom Hearts than I was at Devil May Cry. See, we, we each have our thing. Uh, yeah, but, Kingdom um, Hearts was like laughably easy to me compared to this. No, I shouldn't I, say that. That's a, that's over I definitely had some difficulty. I, it, I don't think it was hard. I mean, maybe I just didn't have the patience for it, but I just... I found so many things in that game bullshit and would often just bash my head against the wall. But really with the first game, the other games were fine. That first game, I, I kind of, I like the series, but I think that first game is kind of a bad game, at least design wise, but that's just me. I didn't I, have I, nostalgia I'd have for to it. really think about it again. But anyway, so uh, you defeat Mundus, uh, then, or so you think, and then he comes back to see Trish on the floor. Yeah. And do you, do you want to read the line or me? Cause, you can read the line. Okay. So he goes up to dead Trish and gets all sad. I mean, they already heard the line his, at the beginning you know, of the episode. Yeah, yeah. His, his, you know, his mommy died. And so he just starts going like, ah, oh, why? I should have been the one to fill your dark heart with light. <laughs> it's so and There's bad. that other cool guy slip up where... Dark soul, right? Dark yeah, soul with Dark light. soul with light. Uh, where, Dante, you're better than that. I There's... He loses his cool factor a lot in the last like ten minutes of this game. Yeah. After you defeat Mundus, there is there's that scene. Even the 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 final dialogue stuff with because you find out later on. Spoiler alert. Uh. Well. He so he leaves Trish. Sorry. Well, before yeah, we do the then spoiler, you have to he escape Trish. the island. It starts falling apart. You have five minutes to get through the underworld, back to Mallet Island, and then out. Something we should have mentioned in the very beginning of the game, the the game is um you're wa- when you're just walking around there's an airplane and so you need to make your way to that airplane because that's how you get out off the island. Do you even see the airplane in the beginning yeah. of the game? I don't. Remember yeah, it's in that like the second room. It's just hanging out. Oh yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. And well, and one of the other things we didn't even mention the, one of their other ways of gatekeeping is that the, it's really simplistic gatekeeping, not necessarily skill gatekeeping. But you, every now and then, you come to a door that's blocked off with like this mysterious force, and right, it can hand. actually hurt you. The hand will come the out hand and is hurt very you. Cool. Uh, but you, if you have to kill all the enemies, and then that shatters the hand, and then you mm-hmm. can go through. 
I when I was watching this guy go through it, there's only two moments in the entire like escape sequence where you actually had to kill a certain number of mm-hmm. enemies to get back yep. through a door. So I actually thought, from what I saw, it was pretty fair. Yeah, it was no, overall pretty fair. I, I was actually kind of dreading that part because I remembered it and got through it pretty easily. Um, and then you get you know you get to the room with the plane, and as you're about to get onto the plane, the the ground falls out from under you and I guess you fall down to the basement and then like we alluded to Mundus is back and now he's a lot more like grotesque. You know, he's got like a bunch of eyeballs and you fight, you fight him a third and final time, but he's pretty easy. The reason why is because right before you fight him, Trish pops up. She's alive from demon magic. Whatever. I don't the power of love demon magic love and she kind of upgrades Dante so like this is a, a constant in the series not I, not every game does it but often the final boss fight is meant f- for you to be overpowered it's supposed to make you feel yeah like there, a the other games do even uh, Final Fantasy 7 does yeah. this if you ever did you play Final 7 I forget. yeah way way back yeah. when it first came out I, I they, it's kind of fuzzy Um, now I, I watched when I was watching the long play of it I saw that, like, they do this one. I admit it. I actually thought it was kind of cool. Like, Dante kills Mundus with these, like, he takes his two pistols and he shoots them. And Trish has this kind of cool line. I forget. what. Do you remember what she says? She says, she says, like, and that's a wrap. And then Dante says, jackpot, which is kind of like his catchphrase. And then Dante says, give my regards to my son, because the whole time Mundus is going, I'll be back. I'll get you. But... That whole dark soul with light instantly negate it by the line, give my regards to my son because Dante is cool. But and who's his son? Line. Well, it's him just basically saying, like, I don't give a crap. I beat you. Like, come try it again, bro. My son will kill you, too. He, You know that, like, old f- argument, like, my dad could beat up your dad? He basically said, my son can beat up you. He doesn't have a son, though. Well, he's saying, like, in the future, because Moonus is going, line. I'm going to be back. It's a cool line. He's a cool guy. It didn't make any sense. He doesn't have a son. He doesn't have a son that died, as far as I'm aware. Or at least, maybe you, maybe he did. But No, he doesn't have a son. Um, then it do- the line doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some Dante Juniors out there. <laughs> Dante enough. seems like the type of guy who maybe, uh, maybe has a... A few he gets around, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, he's so cool that obviously <laughs> the ladies love That's, him. Yeah. Um. So then it there's an escape sequence. Yeah. Where you get on into the get airplane in the and you fly out, and then and that that's God, the final. I watching that, I thought that was bullshit the, too. Yeah. Thank God that sequence is short. I remember playing it when I was young. I you died multiple times. You it's so hard see. to steer that thing, and you can't see from watching the dude play. There's fire all like there's fire. Like, there's rocks. Two, there's pillars. Like there's maybe a solid. Uh, three quarters of the screen are covered by flames mm-hmm. and you only can see the center of it and the other three quarters around it are all blocked yeah. off by fire and it's so hard to see anything coming. Yeah, I, I won't lie. The, this time around, I hit almost everything. I had just upgraded my health enough where I made it through it. I like I, I just had enough health where I didn't die even though I hit it's everything. Insane. It's, it's insane. a very It's a very sturdy plane. Um, and that ends Devil May Cry once you escape, once you get out of there. Yeah, and then it goes to that, you know, Devil Never Cry. And you find out Trish and Dante are now working together to, yeah. for the demon hunting and service. he's maybe dating his... Uh, uh, one thing, yeah, we didn't mention him. Right before, back to, way during the um the the reveal that Trish is evil. Well, we we did talk about it a little bit. Well, that she, no, no, yeah, I know. But um, when the reveal that Trish is evil, Moonus does actually talk about the fact that it's not a coincidence that he looks like his Moondis mom. Moonus created she, her, yeah, right? She, yeah, Moonus created Trish to look like his mom to get in his head. I guess he figured I can use this. I guess she's kind of like a succubus to lure him to Mallet Island. Yeah, and then. Yeah, so then, you know, him and woman who he's maybe dating, who, who looks, looks like, like his mom. mom. Exactly. Not like even his just mother. looks like his mom. She just essentially is, but with a different personality. Well, it's, it's not his mom, but she, it's, it's, it'd be like if a completely different woman took over his mom's body. Yeah. And it's, but it's not technically. It's something his mom's that, um, body. that Devil May Cry 5 actually does really well is it really, you, you, you get flashback cutscenes with his mom, and like they do a good job of making you see, like, they literally look exactly alike. 
That's wild. That's yeah. so weird. So yeah, um, and you know, maybe he's not dating her. When I was young, I certainly got the impression that they were a couple afterwards. But yeah, so then yeah, game ends with they've rebranded to Devil Never Cry. And <laughs> it sounds like you're ready to cry just saying that. Yeah, it it that one hurt a little bit <laughs> because Devil May Cry is a, a cooler name. I oh, would 100%, certainly never 100%. I would never call a business that's called Devil Never Cry. It's pretty bad. So to kind of close off our close out our conversation on Devil May Cry, what is your final impressions of the game? Where do you th- how do you think it holds up, especially cuz you just replayed it? Do you yeah. think it do you think it still holds up? I personally think it does and it doesn't. I actually think the gameplay holds up decently well, but the dodging controls I think are a little meh and then obviously the camera angles are bad. So I think in terms of just overall the cameras and just some of the control stuff, I don't think it holds up, but I do think the gameplay is well paced enough despite my issues with the difficulty that it holds up overall. Yeah. So um, going back into this game, you know, when, when I first got this game, I was 11 ish and I didn't have money to really buy games like that. So I played this game on every difficulty. I got as much time out of it as I could. And so, and then I had it, you know, I, I eventually got Devil May Cry 2 and 3. I got the five anniversary, five year anniversary pack, and that's when I played 2 and 3. Um, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I basically didn't touch this game again once I got 2 and 3. So coming back to it all these years later, you know, 10, 15 years later, I was a little weary. You know, you, you had started replaying it for the episode before me. You were kind of mixed about it. You were pretty down on it. You, you came around, but you were pretty down on it pretty early on. That's just because I was so yeah. bad at it. And so I was pretty, you know, nervous going into it. And honestly, even like, you know, back when you asked me to do this episode, it's funny because I remember thinking, well, I love Devil May Cry, but is there really that much to talk about? I'd love to do something like God of War or Persona 4. And I think I'd even mentioned to you like offhand one day, like, oh, yeah, I'm a little worried about keeping a conversation with this game. And you you had said, like, well, do you want to not do it? But I, I wanted to do it. I am definitely glad I did because not only did I remember how much I love this game, but didn't you also say I was the only person who listed Devil May Cry? Yeah, I was surprised. Not No one else listed it. And it's a pretty iconic series. Yeah, and and an iconic like it started on the PS2 and it still remains one of the most iconic mm-hmm. game franchises out there. Yeah, and so, you know, I'm I'm glad you did ask me to do it because I would argue then like, you know, plenty of people can talk to you about God of War. Only I could talk to you in this situation about Devil May Cry. I know I'm not the world's biggest Devil May Cry fan, but I'm the biggest Devil May Cry fan I know. And out of the apparently out of the people I asked to be on the all yeah. the episodes for the summer of PS2, apparently out of all of I've them as well. Always loved this series. Playing this game when I was eleven ish, honestly had a huge impact on me. Dante as a character, yes, he has his really cheesy lines, but like you know his like attitude and just too cool for school vibe. They kind of left a huge impression on me. I you know I'm a pretty sarcastic guy. And honestly, that could maybe be because of things like, like, it's not like he was the first character to ever do that, but it could be things like Dante maybe had a, an impression on me growing up. He is a sarcastic, like a lot of his dialogue to the enemies and even Trish is very sarcastic. Yeah, there, I remember, you know, replaying the game when you can just look at the different items. When you go into the bedroom where you do the mirror scene with Nilo Angelo, there's a portrait, I guess, of the people who own the castle. And he talks about them, the couple, and then he mentions, you know, he talks about the the guy, and then he talks about the woman, and then it ends with dot, 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 cute. Like, as in, like, you're in this creepy island, and you're just thinking about how cute the woman who's in the portrait is. I do think, even though he's got a lot of cheesy moments, and a lot of this game is very dated in terms of its storytelling ideas, especially the way that, like, Dante as a character reeks of early 2000s and late 90s. But with all that said, I still really like his character because he is the fact that he's half human, half demon is already mm-hmm. cool. I don't care who you are; that's a cool thing. Uh, I agree. He looks pretty cool. Actually, his design of wearing a red, uh, a red, uh, like his red jacket, is because in Japanese culture, red is t- uh, typically worn by heroes. So it makes that's why that his jacket is red. Mm-hmm. So he's designed to look like a hero, even from a Japanese cultural standpoint. Yeah. And 
it's just like he's this half demon, half human who doesn't seem like he can be killed by anything. He doesn't act like anything can kill him. But what I like about him is that, you know, something could it's that he he does have fear. You can see it. You can tell. But he exudes so much confidence that you know you're just going to be able to make through it. I like that in mm-hmm. a character. I think that what's make what makes him a cool character to me is that he is vulnerable, despite being a badass half demon, half human, but super powerful, more powerful than most demons. He so he's super badass and powerful, but he still has a vul- he's still vulnerable. And it's not that he has a vulnerable side. It's not like you know a '80s hair metal band where they'll do like a super heavy song and then they have a, a power ballad. It it feels like he actually is a character where, yeah, I, I'm super cocky and I'm super badass, but at the same time, he gets scared. There's moments where mm-hmm. he thinks he's going to die throughout the story, yeah. and I think that's what makes him a really compelling character. Yeah, and honestly, later games, he only he only becomes better. Um, you know, Devil May Cry 3, Devil May Cry 2, kind of, it, it's a shame it's such a bad sequel because it kind of doubles down on the, the wrong parts of it. Like, there's even less story in that game. There's even uh. less... But like like Dante just kind of in that game feels like he doesn't care. Um, there it, it's pretty uninspired. The bosses and the designs are boring. But Devil May Cry three then doubles down on all the right things. Virtually everything about that game is better. Um, Dante as a character, the storytelling, the gameplay, and so just yeah, you, know, you know, back to um, back to what I was originally saying of like you know replaying this game. I've loved this series since I played it and I hadn't played this first game in so long. And so I'm very happy to see that. I still love this game. And you went back and kind of rediscovered yeah. what you liked and didn't like about yeah. the game. And honestly, I beat this game the other night and immediately started Devil May Cry 3. Did you? Yeah. Really? That's funny. And now I'm playing through that and I'll probably jump right over to four or five. Um, five is really good. Funny thing too is like, you know, they, they Dante as a character just becomes kind of they kind of just turned up to 11 like his character doesn't change that much they just make him more ridiculous it's and, a very fast and furious yeah, yeah list. It, it it literally is We're that, both fast that, and that furious exact fans as well yes that exact like absurd action but playing it straight and devil may cry four and five five especially does the perfect balance of dante is so sincere about all of this stuff but <laughs> and and the game knows it's ridiculous but nobody's out there saying well, he's an idiot. Like, there's literally a point in Devil May Cry 5 where he gets a hat for a weapon and he just starts doing a Michael Jackson dance. And it's like, beat for beat, a perfect Michael Jackson dance. And then when he finishes, the characters are all like, oh, that was cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it just worked. They just play it in the perfect way. And so I'm really happy to see that I still love this first game. It's not the best game. It's probably right in the middle. Um most people would say three is the best. I would say three or five. Um, I'm replaying three now, so I'll kind of have my definitive idea of where the series ranks. But I would say that um, the original one, it's probably like the fourth best. I would say three, five, and Ninja Theory's game, I all think are better. There are people who would crucify me for saying Ninja Theory's game is better, but it's a good game. It's weird, because I remember when that came out a lot of... Like, everyone I worked with, I worked at GameStop at the time, they all liked it a lot. It's a cool game. Um, Something you might appreciate in that game, Dante isn't half human, he's half demon, half angel. I think that's hmm. pretty cool. He's a, I think they call it a Niflheim. And that game... It, I I th- I honestly think people don't like that game mainly because they made Dante look emo. Like emo Dante was a huge thing when that game came out. Yeah. And but like that game's got such a good attitude. It's got great level design and character design and like it's not the best one, but it's definitely not the worst. It's not Devil May Cry 2. Fair enough. I think that's a good place to leave off at then. So uh that yeah, that's our episode on Devil May Cry. So thank you all for listening. Cody, thank you for joining me. This was a really fun conversation. I actually really i we got an hour and a half out of this, and I've enjoyed pretty much all of it. Yeah, we we have basically done half of the length of this game. There were probably people who could beat Devil May Cry in less time. Oh yeah, there's speedrunners who's beaten yeah. game in less time than this. The, yeah, this was really fun. I'm I'm really glad that I was on. Like I said, I'm glad I did this episode because I got to rep Devil May Cry and. Someone's um, got to do it. Yeah, and it, you know, it, it's a great time to be a fan of the series. Five just came out. It was the first game since 2013, and Devil May Cry 4 came out in 2008. So, like, and, you know, back at uh, the Game Awards, they 
they won an award and said Devil May Cry is back. Devil May Cry 5 sold well. 6 will probably happen. Um, the dude who did the Castlevania series on Netflix is doing a new Devil May Cry anime. Oh, really? Yeah, there's an old anime. It's not bad. It, it It's nothing special. It, it's good, but I'm excited for that. It's If you're thinking about playing Devil May Cry, this is the best time to play it because you can literally play every single one on current consoles. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So uh, that wraps it up for this episode. As usual, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StillLoadingPod on all of them. If you want to contact me, you can also contact me at StillLoadingContact at gmail.com. You can also, if you want to support the show, please consider checking out the Patreon. Even just a dollar a month will help me grow the show so I can do more things with it. That's patreon.com slash stillloadingpod. Check out all the great members of the Podbeard Network. You can go to podbeardnetwork.com. Is there anything you want to plug, Cody? Um, Any per- social media you would want to plug? I know we, you're not really on like yeah. Twitter or Instagram well, or anything I, like that. I'm but. on them. You know, if people want to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is at wearecody. I'm not out there like streaming or anything like that. I'll occasionally tweet things or retweet things about games and comics. Um, I would love to eventually maybe even start a podcast of my own because this is a lot of fun to do. I'm a, I talk a lot, so it's kind of right up my alley. But um, no, I mean, you know, nobody, nobody needs to follow me, but thank you very much for having me on. It thank a good you time. for joining me. Um, and that should wrap it up. So thank you all once again for listening, and I will see you all next time.